I couldn't have done this with better people than Simon and Jim. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, 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 it's been an amazing journey and, and to, to, you know, to be so lucky to, is to be able to you know, spend all this time working with your friends on, on these important questions. I mean, that, that by itself was, was enough. This is just an incredible icing on a fantastic cake. Well, I think the, uh, for me, the line that connects all of this work is that humans always live in an environment of huge challenges and huge opportunities. They are versatile, they are diverse, they are interesting, and they can do horrible things and they can do good things. And institutions are, I think, one of the main things that determine their incentives, their opportunities, how they interact with each other. So that's part of the reason why we were drawn to institutions as a central part in human history. And our current work is a lot about the malleability of technology. How do we use our knowledge, our scientific understanding, uh, our way of manipulating the world for very different ways. Some very good, like increasing our prosperity, our health, our comfort. Some horrible, like killing each other. And I think we have come to the view that the link between institutions as a key determinant of human incentives and human motivations and technology is one of the central questions of today. But actually, also some of the themes from our previous work and my work with Jim are equally critical in this juncture because I think the only way we can deal with the technological challenges as well as other things such as aging, inequality, climate change is by building a broad societal consensus. And we're not going to be able to do that unless we have strong institutions in particular. We don't unless we have democratic institutions. So one, one connection and, and a little bit of a contrast that I see is if you read our original work, for example, the Colonial Origins paper that, that a lot of people have read, in that um, work, we, we had a good explanation, and I think it still stands for why some countries are so much richer than other countries. So uh, at the top of the, of the list, more or less, is the United States. And we wrote that at the end of the 1990s, the United States was riding pretty high in terms of economic prosperity. But, but clearly, in, in the intervening 20 years, and I suppose when you go back and look at it, the pressures were coming before, there's lots of pressures in the US, including on institutions, including from technology, for exactly the kind of reasons that, that Durant Durant's talked about. So in Power and Progress, our, our book that came out last year, we really explored those, those pressure points and, and tried to understand, you know, what has gone wrong or, or not gone as well as it, you might have previously expected in industrialized countries, but also what can be done about it. And, and, and for me, a part of the, the thrill of this work has always been attempting to connect it to policy and think about how we can get to a better world. It's not always direct, it's not always um, in, immediate and obvious, but it's, it's a good question to push on. And I think it's a very MIT question. I think MIT as an engineering school, to me, and I was a graduate student here a long time ago, has always been about, all right, fine, good, good point, what's your solution? What are you going to do? What should we do differently? Give us the recommendations. And I think that's an entirely reasonable approach and one that we continue to pursue in our Shaping the Future Work Initiative. I love that can-do attitude. Yeah. <laughs> I'm from the I'm from the north of England, which also features pretty prominently in Power and Progress. And, and you know we've had our ups and downs, but you have to keep going and you have to keep pushing. And and uh, I, I also want to shout out to David Orter, our, our co-director of Shaping the Future of Work, who is a fantastic uh, colleague and absolutely an integral part of what we're doing going forward. And and it, we're just beginning. I think we won this young Duran, is my perspective. I think even we might even be very young to have won it. Frankly, so you mean so, we're not going to retire. <laughs> Well, might retire in order to work harder. I think that, that's a kind of drawn approach to this, uh, that sort of problem. I think uh, my current research agenda very much builds on the ideas that I just shared, which all originate from this research agenda. Uh, in fact, I am at the very, very, very early sort of twinkle in the eye stage of two major projects, one with Simon, one with Jim. The one with Jim is on rethinking democracy for the 21st century, but not just like a practical guide, that, that's part of it, but more importantly, a different conceptualization of democracy, where it comes from, why it is an appealing idea, but also a self-contradictory idea. And from that understanding, uh, both develop a uh, different theory of human interactions that's complementary to what we have done, but also learn lessons about what we can do in order to make democracy work better. And then together with Simon, can tell you more about that, is uh, rethinking what it is 
to be human in the age of AI, what is distinctive about humans, what we are going to hopefully keep and develop with the aid of AI, but also all the threats that the wrong development of AI would pose. So this is also a rethinking of what it means to be a productive, socially useful human part of a collective society and the role of AI. Yeah, I, I'd like to write more, more books. I find writing books with my friends absolutely fascinating. One, one with Daron, which he already gave away the good stuff. So we've got to rush to write it now, Daron, because other people are going to be jumping in there. Uh, second book is, is an explainer of the global economy and how the big picture fits together. I've had thousands of MBA students come through my classrooms with fantastic questions about, okay, how does that work? What is this? And I think based on the work that Daron and I have done, including with Jim, including now with, with David and, and with others, we, we have a lot of these pieces, but putting it together in, in, a, in a fashion that people can relate to and that they can understand and carry with them on the plane and, and show it to their mother-in-law. That, I mean, that's really, a, really interesting to do. And the third project is a novel, a science fiction novel. I'm not, I haven't even pitched that or explained it to Daron yet. Well, which, I which, you told me, you told me. Oh, it's a lot of, it's a lot of fun and, and um, it's also an attempt to explain some of these deeper points that we're getting at but through it it was proposed by some of my students actually who said you know why don't you tell us a story tell us some fiction engage the reader in a different way engage a different kind of reader oh and of course we have the cartoon version <laughs> of power and progress which it, which is well underway already and that's fantastic working with these visual artists at, at Boston University absolutely brilliant uh, people and that has opened up all kinds of interesting new possibilities for ways we can organize the outreach and engagement because I, th I think engagement Engagement and engaging people is, is essential to understanding what, what's available and what the options are and to the democratization issue, right? Because if people don't see or understand what's going on, if they can't grasp it, if they can't think it out for themselves, if they can't argue for themselves, they can, they're not likely to, to buy into it. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I mean, my journey is a long one, actually, because uh, I've mentioned it in a few places, but perhaps not so prominently, so it's great to share it w with you guys here. Uh, you know, I was interested in economics. I became interested in economics as a teenager, precisely because, you know, growing up in Turkey uh, at a time when there were deep economic problems and a military dictatorship, at least for the first part of my teenage years, uh, and then a controlled democracy, I became interested in questions of, you know, what's the relationship between democracy, economic prosperity, political conflict, I had no idea what these questions really meant, but they sort of started forming in my mind and appealed to me. And little did I know, I thought, well, I want to study economics because this must be what economists study. And, uh, and so I enrolled to do economics at the University of York. Uh, it was my, uh, my own idea, what with my parents' uh, support to get out of Turkey because uh, I would get myself in trouble in Turkish universities. Uh, <laughs> so University of York, a safe place in the northern uh, north of England, I think, uh, would be a, a, a better place. As soon as I went there, I realized this is not what economics studies. This you know, supply, demand, unemployment, those are all fun things. I was attracted to them, but you know, this wasn't what economics was about. So I put them aside. And then towards the end of my dissertation, I started saying, well, couldn't we apply these tools that we've learned from macro, micro, all of these things in order to go back to these questions I didn't exactly know how to do. I started pursuing a few things uh, in a rather incohate manner, but that's when I ran into Jim Robinson, a similar lost soul, and it turned out that we had uh, similar passions and similar dissatisfaction with the narrowness of the questions, especially in macro. And so that started a, uh, a long collaboration, which we were very fortunate to have Simon join in the late 1990s. So, so John and I are both from the north of England in a strange way. <laughs> Actually, both from Yorkshire, because I grew up in Sheffield. He went to the University of York. Little detail a lot of people don't know. So I, I, spent, I, I was a graduate student at MIT, got my PhD in 1989, spent about 10 years in Eastern Europe working on that post-communist transition and trying to use the standard tools of economics that Daron just talked about to understand what was going on, to study banking and to study uh, the politics and the economics of change. It was very frustrating because a lot of those tools didn't have the bite that I, I expected. And I, I started to be interested in corruption, in the unofficial economy, and, and and I met Daron, I remember we, I think we, were, we attended a couple of seminars together and, and I got engaged in this, in this conversation. Daron's always, Daron is, is just amazing at, at, at engaging, at listening. I mean, that's why, you know, his social network is his co-authorship network and it spans the entire globe. And Daron said to me, well, you know, we have this interesting thought about uh, colonization and, and colonial strategy, but we'd need to find an instrument and we need, need, and he described to me what it would be about. And he said, you know, and I, and I, and my first thought was, um, 
basically, this is an impossible task. And my second <laughs> thought right after was, let's go, let's do it. And I spent about six months of my life, uh, you know, and, and that was, I didn't have tenure yet. It's risky you're putting all this time into, a, you know, a big project that might pay off or not. And I, and I brought these ideas to draw on potential instruments, one after the other. And he's like, no, Simon, no, 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 that doesn't work either. And then I brought him Settler Mortality. Um, and actually, by, by, the time, by the time I had the idea, um, by the time the idea came to me, because I had enough interaction with Drawn, I knew this one was going to work. And he looked at it and he said, right, let's do this. And, and with Drawn, you go from not being able to do the project to 120 miles an hour in three seconds. So we were running, running really hard. And then when that paper was done and all the robustness checks and we, we closed it out, for 24 hours, I was just exhausted, slumped in my chair. Thank goodness that's over. And I thought, you know, I've got another idea I want to take to Drawn. And it turns out to be addictive. Working with you is seriously addictive. It must be the adrenaline or something. You just got to keep going. And I'm, you know, that 20 papers later, uh, here we are. I, I, I think that the, the, the most fun part of the entire uh, research process, the thing that I've enjoyed the most looking back over 20 years, is young, smart people taking up our ideas, taking them seriously, using them in, in, in a really smart way, looking at within country variation, for example, Melissa Dell's work, uh, Lakshmi Aya, uh, absolutely fantastic. And I thank all of these people who took us seriously and, and, and devoted their time and bet their careers on, huh, let's find out if this works in Peru, or if it works in India, or if, or if it works in, in, in some, some part of Africa. And, and of course, everywhere is different, but I think the pattern that emerges is absolutely consistent with what we found and what we proposed as, as an interpretation in, in, in those early papers.